let's find out. I'm not sure it's working. It could be working. Stream health is green, apparently. I am apparently live, according to the YouTubes. Let me turn that off. Well. Hello, everyone. My name's Ben, coming to you from UnchartedX.com. Testing out a little bit of live streaming. I uh, have been wanting to set this up for a little while, so, I mean, if you're watching this, you can give me some feedback, let me know, levels are right, all that type of thing, trying to figure it out. I wanted to review an interesting site today. I had, I kind of had this idea after an email exchange with Chuck from the CF Apps 7865 channel um, to talk about Corral. He asked me a question about Corral, and I was like, well, I should go and review all of the footage that I've got of Corral. I've been there. We went there in 2015. It's an interesting little site. And I thought, this wouldn't be a bad thing to do for people that are interested and do it on a live stream. And also gives him a chance to grab any of this footage if he wants it. Um, or to see the type of thing that I've got. But um, let's find out if it shows up on Google Earth. Corral Peru. Yeah. Go. I am streaming in 720. I... Nope. Hello, let me... Oh, hey Ian. How you doing? Glad to see some people actually watching. Okay. Oh, that's good. Because, I mean, I'm. they say that uh, the audio is good and it's smooth. That's nice because I do live in the bush uh, up here. I don't have any connections other than a microwave connection. So my internet bandwidth isn't exactly what you would call stellar if you live in a city or something like that and you're used to some nice high-end uh, internet, but I have to live with 16 and 16, which is, believe me, screaming for microwave. Corral. So this is an interesting site. This is not your typical Peruvian or South American site. Everyone thinks about, you know, Machu Picchu, Tiwanaku, Oli, Alante Tambo, all those sort of sites that are up in the highlands. They're in the mountains. Cusco itself is at 11,000 feet. Corral, as you saw as we zoomed in, is actually pretty close to the coast. It's in the coastal desert, I guess you would say. This is all really dry, crazy areas. Um, and it's a massive site. It's, 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 it's actually something like 180 acres. Uh, I think this is where you come in at the visitor center. It's a pyramid site. It's really odd. It doesn't seem to fit the timeline of anything that's in South America otherwise. Um, it's a yeah. I mean, there's, you have a lack of pyramids in general when you when you go up into the highlands. It's also dated far far before. Like it's a long. It's so much older than uh, any of the other South American stuff. I mean, Incas, Mayas. If you take the Orthodox dating, they're all you know 500 AD. They I mean obviously they their their origins go back before that, but they're a relatively recent culture. This stuff is contemporary with the mainstream accepted dating of the pyramids. So 3000 BC, they found carbon dated remains on this site of up to, oh, this is nice actually, up to, you know, um, around 3000 BC. So carbon dating is always an interesting topic. It's not something, you, obviously you can't date stone with the carbon dating. It's really just evidence for the last campfire that was uh, pre <laughs> in the pregame for the first UFC card on ESPN. I'll be watching that as well, mate. I, uh, I watched some of the Bellator last night, and I will be catching at least some of that UFC card later on. Um, I'm not sure who's going to win the main event, but this—it's—it's it's sort of—it's a huge site. Like, so it's—it's uh, it's, there's a lot of pyramids. There's been a lot of work that's gone on here. It's kind of a mystery. And as I was saying, carbon dating—you—you you, you pretty much are just dating the last person to have built a campfire there, or the, the last person that maybe died there. It's only really an indication of the youth of the site if you like it may go back far beyond that i have my own theory around this in particular like you, you different environmental areas are going to preserve carbon remains in different ways this is a very dry site it's arid it's a desert uh, i believe that you would probably have carbon remains would would last longer in this type of environment than they would say up in the highlands of peru where it can be rainy it can be tropical uh, it's certainly green and lush and i'm just you know it's jungles and places like that don't form fossils. Um, 
they don't really carbon remains tend to break down it's it's uh, you only find things like fossils and remains like this in particular areas and this is one where it looks like they've you know you can't get away from the, the dating that it is it is sort of contemporary with the Egyptian pyramids anyhow let's have a look at some of the imagery actually let's just go to the video I do have a bunch of this video lined up here and I thought I'll do it in the editing program just because um, it's easier to uh, to zoom in on stuff if we want to see it it's an interesting so you can get to it it's a two or two and a half hour drive north of Lima we uh, were there we just rented a local sort of tour guide phone someone that was willing to take us out there there were these guys here um, it's an active site so that they're actively working on it there's there are um, there are archaeologists up there they're actually actively digging and trying to preserve the site Ian asks do you does Kral remind you of a massive verde at at all it's a little bit it's you'll see when we, we go in here I don't know if you've seen it or you've seen much footage of the site um, it's 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 I'm not sure what exactly it is it's not I wouldn't say it's megalithic it although there are certainly some large stones that have been used but this is very typical of the sort of building style that you see here it's small masonry uh, with with mortar, some sort of mud mix mortar or cement that's been formed to, to build all the pyramidal courses and in fact all of the structures, they're not all pyramids, there's a lot of structures, some of the things they attribute to being kind of housing for the elite that live there, of course it's all ceremonial naturally, it's the only reason people did things in the old days was for ceremony um, but it's a tremendous amount of work you have some very large structures on this side, obviously it's all well broken down and there are some areas that have some really large blocks of stone and it's stone that's it's also granite and hard stone that's been worked it doesn't it doesn't seem to have the same sort of precise really tight fitting masonry or even the really large blocks but there's definitely some blocks in here that have got to be a ton two tons in some of the core levels and the lower levels of the masonry which is typical again you know the older stuff tends to be the biggest it's a massive site too, as you can see. You, you have this is the pretty typical for this part of Peru. It's desert and it's cloud. You know, it's it's. I believe that uh, there is sort of a mist that sets on the on the ground. You do have these weird sort of ecosystems that live and and stuff that thrives in this type of environment. But this is was pretty desert. And when you look in, there's actually pictures of this later, and I'll, I'll we'll go through the photos. But there are, it, it's like a pile right here. If we if I stop it, stop it, pause it. This is these are river stones. There are these things are everywhere. So this was all ancient riverbed. I'm not exactly sure at what point um, this was riverbed, but there was definitely water flowing through here at some point. I've got to imagine that you would probably build this in an area that had water and had some more natural resources rather than just building it in a desert. So, but I'm not really that aware of the geological time frame in terms of well that river was here millions of years ago. That river was here during let's say last ice age. Uh, and this was a tropical area. Certainly this is well south of any glaciation line, so I would suspect this was a more temperate tropical area even during the last ice age, which makes it probably more viable for this type of gigantic amount of work. Like all these hills are man-made. Yeah, right, that's a good comment. It wasn't a desert thousands of years ago. The ancient's not crazy to build in the desert. I agree, like that's the, I think that's a big clue for a lot of these sites, the Sphinx as well, right? I mean, that's the big, the big debate over the rainfall erosion that's at the Sphinx, obviously. It could only have occurred when it was a temperate tropical area, most likely occurred as rain out as, a, as an after effect of the Younger Dryas Cataclysm, whether that was a comet or whatever you believe, I think it was a comet. That's the next video I'm working on actually is um, Ice Age Cataclysms. But we walked into this, so it's actually, it's, <laughs> This, is, this seems to happen a lot when you go to these places. Um, we nearly got thrown out of this place, uh, which I've nearly been down, thrown out of a number of places. I've been asked to leave a couple, but uh, there's Luke and Marie. Marie's a lovely lady. She, she comes with us on all of the travels. And I know Luke's been traveling a lot in the last couple of years and she's been going with him as well. But, you know, it's a giant site. It's hundreds of acres and they put in little pathways and they go around there, but they, they're trying to shove people in and out of this place within 45 minutes there's nobody there and of course we're pretty resistant to the idea of just marching in and out of a place inside of 45 minutes but 
you know, and we were dragging our heels and just arguing because we and our tour guide got a little concerned. He's like, you know, I need the business. I'm not trying to, I'm tr not trying to upset the the archaeologists. And eventually, one of the head guys, the archaeologist, came over and was like, "What are you guys doing?" I'm like, "Well, we're taking our time. We're in interested in the site." And they tried to make us leave, and we're like, "We're not doing it." And then went and wrote some comments in their guidebook, and eventually, we did leave a few hours later. But pretty typical of some of the stuff that happens in. Peru and Bolivia, unfortunately, it's like a reluctant tourism. They, 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 they like the idea, but they really don't want you poking around too much or doing anything other than the cursory glance, which I think is what probably most people do. Uh, I mean, I this happens everywhere. I've been in the Great Pyramid a few times and I've been lucky enough to spend like 45 minutes in the so-called King's Chamber just on my own and there was just a few periods in time in, in that 45 minutes where people you'd hear people coming up the gallery and they'd literally come in they'd look around oh that's nice and they'd walk out straight again like two minutes dad i imagine not everybody's into this stuff to the same degree but for me it's like no there's a lot more to see and to think about but and to just experience being in there i've been in that place with a lot of people in some of the closed off tours and there's people toning and chanting and roaring and it's just noise but the most rewarding experience is being in there on your own and being quiet and just experiencing it for a length of time, like, you know, 45 minutes or something, laying down inside the box. I was lucky to have that happen. And you go to Egypt now and do it because everyone's scared to go to Egypt, so they pack out Machu Picchu. Anyway, so this is some other things that are interesting. There are these little courtyards at this area, that's, and they, I think some of this has been deliberately buried over. They actually found like a body of a child that was in one of these areas and, and buried over, which is unusual because something else they, they found at, at Corral is no evidence whatsoever of any weapons or warfare or, tip, you know, some of these places were always assumed to be, you know, forts and fortifications and things, but this doesn't seem to be the case at Corral and it's actually acknowledged by the mainstream guys that this was a peaceful civilization, at least from what they can tell. And these are huge structures all of this is man-made. Um, just a whole collection of pyramids. We'll go through this and then I'll take a look at some photos. Let me just read these comments. Since, uh, since been yeah, it's a good it's a good theory. I'm not sure exactly what um, the original function of pyramid structures were. I'm sure some of them are are what they are. Which I mean, some of these some of the the structures are ceremonial for lack of a better term but I do not believe that's the case for Giza for even some of the pyramids in South America the the pyramid of the sun and the moon there's all sorts of weird stuff going on in there when you look at, at the layers of different types of metals they found in the courses what's been taken out of the pyramids certainly the Giza pyramids I think the whole sun belt the whole the whole the whole old kingdom structures Aburawash down to Dashur all of that was some sort of functional machine. I my best guess is that it's not something that we can comprehend right now. I, Chris Dunn comes close. You know, he I think his theory explains a lot. He predicted what was behind Gatenbrink's door fairly accurately, more so than anyone else. Hey, there I am. Um, but we're kind of projecting our perspective onto it when we think of them as water. I think it's possible. I, I think it's also just as possible that there was something to do with the acoustics or the energy fields or the or the just the what would you call it, the energetic nature of water somehow. I think that the builders of these ancient sites, in particular the really impressive ones, uh, had some form of working with uh, the elements that we don't comprehend yet or we're just on the path to beginning to comprehend. And I think it's the, yeah, multiple uses exactly. I, and they probably had multiple uses over time as well. Um, same thing, Serapium, same thing, right? That was not ceremonial. Those boxes were doing something. I don't know what. The bottom of the pit of Zaywat El Aran, what's, what was probably down at Abu Ruwash as well. Why are you putting coffers under 20, 30 meters of granite and limestone connected to the earth? I mean, we don't really understand telluric energy, piezoelectricity, some of these fundamental forces, how they work with natural components. And I think they did. And this is the big crime to me is that we should, if we, you don't have to, you don't have to say that we know the answer. We, you don't have to state that oh, it was aliens or it was crystals or it was giants or it was angels. It's just something we don't know. And if we approach it with that type of a mindset, we might actually learn something. I believe science will show us eventually, but we, nobody's done the investigation. Well, very few people get to do any investigation along those lines. 
because if, and as we all know, if it doesn't fit that orthodox picture, then Zahi Hawass and his band of merry men are going to sit on it and do their best to suppress it. I mean, Gaten brings door, man. We've there's a door inside the pyramid that <laughs> we just don't want to find out what's behind it. And same thing with the muon detector where they found that cavity above the Grand Gallery. I mean, there's literally been debate among Egyptologists about not releasing that information purely because it didn't match their story. I mean, it's because somehow it threatens their story. Uh, it's nonsense. Just let go and open your mind and maybe we'll learn something collectively. But as you can see here, it's a giant site. It's a giant site. There's a, a lot of these big pyramids. It's all in this mountainous area. Um, I think that's all of the video I, I had for this. Um, there's a few good panning shots in there. Like this is just the raw footage. I do want to do a site review where I'll go through it and look at it. This was just shame on you. I should you have that drop queued up. I've got another one I'm doing. Um, that's another video I'm going to do because I've met Zahi and I've had some personal experience with him and that running. I was at the debate with Graham Hancock. If you go to look at that video, I'm sitting in the crowd. Um, I have all the raw footage from that too. I was part of trying to get that out afterwards. Uh, and I have another drop of him. There's a good Robert Boval's channel has a bunch of stuff of interviews of Zahi where he's just like, have you read Boval's book? And he's like, no, I wouldn't waste my time. I wouldn't waste my time. I'm, I'm a scientist. I'm a scientist. I want to use that. I'm a scientist drop. But he, I'm like what scientist would bother themselves with reading? <laughs> right? Why would you do that? He's not a scientist, but he's a politician. That man is a just a savage politician. Savvy as well, but that's all he is. Anyhow, let's look at some imagery. Because this place, again, it's it's impressive. I uh, did, We didn't get a chance to have a really close look. As I said, we kind of got harassed and pushed out, but we did manage to get quite a lot of good footage. I'm just going to clip click through these. I don't know how long I'm going to be on stream here. I just wanted to kind of get this out there so Chuck eventually could watch it, but I thought it would be something that was nice for... My stream health is now yellow, apparently. Well, whatever. See, I do have some larger, whether it's bedrock that's been used or not, but there are some large, some good examples of larger stones in amongst all of these pyramids. And I imagine this just had savage erosion take place. In fact, there's, we get down to some back areas, you can see across there's a little creek where there is still some water and there's, um, the site goes on even further than what they're excavating right now. There's, there's, uh, yeah, see all like this, this is it was all concourses of pyramids at one point that's now just steadily eroded over the years. I mean, it's not a bad site to visit. Nobody really goes there anymore. What is interesting is that they have a, a symbol on this site that's part of the uh, logo, I guess. It's a circular spiral. I'll sh there's a picture of it later on. And it's in, and I believe it came from one of the keystones that's on this side. I'm not sure if I've got an image of it. And I've got an image of the logo. But that's actually that's that spiral sign is something that I've seen etched into rock at uh, Pumapunku. And I do have footage of it there. It's actually on top of a big block of andesite or maybe red, sand, red sandstone. But um, that's a sort of interesting coincidence. And then I, I saw on JJ Ainsworth's one of her recent little walk and talks in Turkey, they found the same thing on a block over there as well. But whether or not it means anything, I don't know, but it was a, an interesting coincidence. But yeah, as you can see, like the, the scale of this is, it's impressive. I mean, you, you're still talking about a, a very large population that's required to do this type of work. It's Marie and her crochet hat. It's awesome. Hey, Marie. So here we go. This is so yeah. There are some decent sized blocks, and it's it's all pretty clear. I mean, rough work, but effective. And just, I mean, I'm trying to build stone walls at my property, <laughs> and it ain't easy. I mean, the hardest form of doing it is the way that the megalithic builders did it, where there's no mortar. There's just a perfect fit. I mean, that, that's kind of mind blowing. We don't really do it that way anyway out that way today it's cement is useful doesn't require that level of precision but 
even just making up this mix and building these up for whatever reason. Now, who knows if there's stuff under the dunes, but this is the kind, like, very similar to to Egypt in some in some in some respects, really. So here you go. So this is part of that logo. It's also on the sign, but that's it's. I mean, this is modern. Obviously, this is something. If you ever go to South America, it's something that happens everywhere. As they will write things up on the sides of the hills in in large text like this, so you can see it from the air. You get to see like high school names and school district zones and different political messages. Really, uh, it's all over the place. But yeah. I'm sure what Luke might have been taking pictures of me there. As I get dressed. Yeah, so they use that symbol as part of the uh, the logo. And it's just an interesting connection. I, I, I don't know what it means. Again, you kind of have a lot of broken down structures and they're tarping a lot of this stuff. I'm not sure why, but I guess they're all working on different aspects and areas of it. We couldn't, actually surprisingly limited access. You really can't, they really get on you if you walk off these paths at all. Obviously, any chance we get to do that, we, we did it, but they've got a bunch of people just wandering around the brown shirts and they're making sure you don't step on the stones because you might damage the stones. This is always a a great concern, it seems, to everybody that runs these sites, the authoritarian people. It's very annoying, and it's gotten worse over over years, I'm sad to say. Bolivia in particular, they... I was furious the last time I was at Pumapunku. I mean, just then I'd been there like three years before, I think, and the, uh, the rope off, they just roped off so much more of it, and I mean, it's... It, these things kind of get a little strange when you consider the ownership of them, obviously that the same as Peru, Egypt, here, you understand, I understand that the cultures and the people there claim ownership over it to some degree. Like it's, well, it's in Peru, so it's ours. So we'll, we'll set the rules about who can do what at the site. I mean, you do have to have some controls. I understand that. But it's, it just happens to be in Peru. It's not directly connected to your civilization. It's not something you did. It just is there and it's, it, it, it's a it's the world's history so it's it's a little difficult to accept that you know we're going to decide who can and can't sort of investigate the site when you think that like that's huge look at that thing when you think that um it's kind of a history that belongs to everybody certainly in egypt right that's such a such a big deal so just pictures of the rocks again so this is looks like granite to me um Certainly, we're looking at some hard stones, probably andesite. I'm not in a geology. I'm not an expert. You... But it didn't look like sandstone and soft stuff to me, a lot of this work. But again, you maybe broken up just roughly in a quarry somehow. Not that bad. Yeah, this was one of the sites where they were still working on across the um, little channel of water that was here. I know I've got some examples of the river stones that we found here, but there's there's something like 15 or 18 pyramids. And they actually found, uh, I think that's part of this was deliberately buried. So it's got kind of a Gobleki Tepe vibe to it in terms of they believe that sections of this site were deliberately buried and covered up for whatever reason. I'm not sure. I mean, you got to imagine that if this, even in this area, you, it is the high, it's actually the, coastline of Peru pretty spectacular Lima and all that it's a huge cliff like it's like it's it's there's a really like a really big divide like you do have a little beachy area but then there's a huge cliff that you have to drive up to get to where the most of the land starts and I've got to imagine if this place existed at any point during the Younger Dryas or at that end of the last ice age then they still would have had a rough day when that cataclysm went down I mean it was a global thing right it knocked out half of the megafauna of the world like the the uh, large animals that we're left with today are the other half that survived 
what happened at the end of the last ice age half of them died some of these walls are impressive like these are fairly decent sized stones nothing too massive but up there in the middle you can see some upright stones that are uh, of a decent size and the wall overall is of fairly high quality it's still here today even if the masonry isn't exactly megalithic so I don't really know what to make of this sort of site I mean you can only really go off the carbon dating there's very little left to us from this civilization there are actually ev there were there is evidence of writing tools and uh, recording tools I think um, mathematical recording tools as well as some form of language which is something they claim to that the Inca and the Maya didn't have writing it's I'm not sure that's that's the case Brian Forrest has a really interesting theory about um, the writing of the Inca in particular that there's a, a code or it's, it's I've, actually, I've got some images of it but on their their, their their skirts I guess whatever they were wearing there's a lot of different imagery and a lot of the artwork and the blankets have have a different like it's almost different faces different little symbols and icons all in these little square boxes and he thinks that's a form of writing and what's interesting is in some areas and some of the the tombs in ancient Egypt there is something that looks very similar to that there's almost some South American designs and some artwork that just looks like a dead ringer for the stuff you see in South America and obviously the Egyptian stuff is attributed as being much older but there's a connection there I think and he may, I think he's onto something as well about with with the the different details that are on some of the dress the dress wear and as well as the blankets and uh, some of the artworks you can see in the museum it's possible that that stuff some sort of symbolic language I'm not sure if there's been any studies done to really look at it but um, he did show me a good a good image of that the last time we were in Peru with Brian anyway so there's a lot of this type of thing too I don't mean I don't know how how, how deep all of this goes you see these little canals and gaps between walls I'm not sure what the purpose was here it's a very narrow gap Again, you sort of have these river stones. Anything that's rounded like this, you can see a ton of this stuff is all river stone. Like these rocks don't naturally have these rounded appearances. It's 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 only stones that are in water and moved along, and they wear each other down to make that rounded form. Otherwise, uh, otherwise they have all the sharp edges from when they break. This is something Randall Carson <laughs> taught me. Natural bedrock. Okay. Let me see where are we with this. Find if there's anything really interesting here. Might just speed it up a little. Really just testing out the uh, the live stream. So thanks for the thanks for the eyeballs. Appreciate the help. And let I me mean, actually, if you think it's worth doing, let me know. If you don't think it's worth doing, let me know too. And I know it's not as focused as the as the work I try to normally do but it's just view, reviewing the raw footage of which I have tons and tons from many many different sites and uh, you know I obviously spend a lot of time doing this just trying to put together my typical videos yeah so again good examples of the river rock that is all part of what was an ancient lake bed or river riverbed at some point yeah, as I said, there were a couple of courtyards that actually have these nice aerial views that if you could get to them would be nice to see, but uh, they just wouldn't let us go anywhere near half of this stuff. You certainly couldn't climb up on any of these pyramids, which is a little sad. Um, I'm not sure we're going to damage anything. This is one of the questions I have. It's like people walk on rock. They've been walking on this rock for presumably thousands of years, and it's still here. I know it... Uh, it's another little story on Elephantine Island. I was when I was there with Graham Hancock, and this was the trip that he was supposed to be debating Zahi Hawass. And of course, Elephantine Island's got an interesting history when it comes to the Grail. And Graham Hancock, he wrote the Sign and the Seal, it's a book about the Grail. So he has a little little speech that he wanted to do at Elephantine Island. We gathered around. It's actually, I think, it's the image for my Graham Hancock Q and A's. And he got up and stood on a big block of granite that had some. Um, that had some glyphs on it, and the, uh, the our little minders with us were just sort of really nervous and wigging out, and, and you could see the guy in the back over there, the little keeper, it's a big group of people, he didn't want to come over and 
sort of drag him off it, but Graham's standing on this block of granite, and I think at one point he turned around and said, look, it's granite, I'm not gonna hurt it. And that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's the truth. You're not gonna hurt the granite. I mean, long after we're all gone, the granite's still gonna be there. That whole, I think about the Serapium, like that entire limestone, limestone bedrock, that whole thing's gonna collapse at some point in the future, undoubtedly, and those boxes will still be there. Like, they'll be just be buried. They're not going anywhere. Like, this, they'll still be perfect and underground and just buried. And, uh, yeah, maybe someone in another 10,000 years will find it again. Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously they're digging through. They must find some stuff. I mean, they're, they're actively working on the site. More than I've seen sort of active work on a lot of the Peruvian sites, even Bolivia. It just it blows my mind that people aren't digging at some of these places. Puma Punku in particular, like Puma Punku. They, there's hardly any work going on on there, a little bit here and there, but there's just stuff poking out of walls left, right, and center, like perfectly square andesite blocks with these channels in them just hanging on out the wall. I've got some great images of that. It's just, I think everyone, a lot of people have that reaction to stuff, right? It's like, ah, oh, you should be digging, but it's, the money's got to come from somewhere. And I think one of the big challenges with, with that is the money's got to come from somewhere. Oh, and your objectives have to be in line with uh, the archaeologist's particular view of the history of this site. If you're coming here to show that, oh, this stuff is probably older than we thought it was, or there were people that were had some form of technology that we can't attribute to these ancient civilizations, no, 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 you, you, can't, you can't look here. I'm sorry. It's ridiculous. Because I think if you opened it up to that, you'd probably find there's some people willing to fund it. Um, I think if you put it in that right light too, you might actually attract the right type of funding. Because all of a sudden it introduces mystery, right? It's, it's a becomes a true unknown again. It's the saddest part about this is we just, we, we speak so authoritarian about it now, at least in the mainstream. It's like, we've got this, we've got all these mysteries licked, you know? We know who built the pyramids. We know how all that civilization worked. We know how they did it. They made ramps and they dragged stuff around. They put milk on the sand, whatever they did. It's just like, we just, just you, as if we're trying to eliminate the mystery to it. I think it's much more exciting to think about it as well. There could actually be real mystery here, real, really some sources of untapped knowledge. Seems to me that would make it a lot more exciting to work on and make it probably a lot more interesting to mainstream. There's Luke taking his pictures. Mainstream, uh, a mainstream audience. And who knows, we might actually learn something. That's the other part. Like it's just the pursuit of, open-minded pursuit of knowledge is really all I'm trying to advocate for. I don't really have any theories. I'm happy to listen to any theory as long as there's proof. It's always my big thing. It's like it was written in the Bible, which was written by people. Or it was this or it was that. Okay, you know, giants, show me the giant. I know that just giant bones have been talked about and discovered, but show me the bones, show me the evidence. It's got to be there somewhere. Uh, any any polygonals, any geopolymers there? I don't know. I don't know. It's not a lot of information you can really find about this site. Um, But, yeah, again, like I said, some decent-sized work was done here and there. And I, there, may have, there may be courses below the ground here. But they all seem to have staircases, which is, I guess, similar to the some of the um, Mayan work and the, the certainly Aztec work up north. The pyramids all has their staircases to walk up to on top of them, some sort of... Ceremonial space, right? Always oh, ceremonial. Uh, this, uh, the, the connection to river stones is significant to me just because there's that connection between water again, right? Everything's, all these all these ancient pyramids seem to have a connection to water. And a lot of the megalithic structures do too, like not just the pyramids. The Corrie in Cusco is a great example. There's, a, there's an underground river that runs underneath it. And that's another that's another good mystery, the, the Corrie There was some excavation work done in the bottom of that and they've there was supposed i mean the whole place is riddled with tunnels i mean brian has some interesting stories about just when they do roadworks there's one point they were digging up the street to replace some infrastructure and they found a staircase down into the depths and you just well okay bury it up again again just not of interest but the, the cory cancer itself has this crazy history and of course the vatican shuts it down the church uh that claims all these things they definitely close all that stuff up you don't get access to it it's, it's one of the great 
tragedies, really. I mean, what the hell is hidden in the Vatican archives? Wouldn't that be an interesting experience if you could somehow get convince them? I'm on board. Let me just... <laughs> I'm on board with all this stuff. Let me just go look, poke around. But that's the theory. That's what a lot of people say about giants, right? The Vatican comes in, swoops it up, takes it all away. Father Crespi's stuff in Ecuador. All Vatican priests came up, swooped all that stuff away. I mean, whether you believe it or not, um, that's an interesting story if ever you haven't heard of it the, the father crespi story and the things that supposedly that the local people were bringing him as as treasures and objects and items that came from um sort of unraided tunnels and areas that the spanish never got to from these ancient civilizations and there's some photos of it all it's all like kind of a weird one of those weird stories you can't tell if it's true or how much of it's false and but once crespi died in comes the new priest from the Vatican and shortly thereafter they came in and took everything away and never to be seen again. Anyway, let's see. So yeah, across this river here, you can't get to this stuff over here, but clearly again, this is all more pyramids, just more pyramids. I think you could probably, if I did a proper site review, I'd probably go and count the numbers. I think there's like 18. Um, and some of them are quite large in their base, like a, an acre, some of them. Nothing like crazy steep, but still just ancient and sort of immeasurably ancient at this point. We don't know the carbon dating. I think we're lucky to have carbon dating that puts it back as far as it is. I'm sure that they, if they had their way to mix and match their stories, it wouldn't be this old. But it's hard to deny carbon dating of, of stuff that you find inside these structures, right? I mean... You either have someone or something, just some organic material that was put inside the structure, which means it, it can't have been put there after, or at least presumably wasn't. It's good when it works for them, and then they don't like it when it works against them. Uh, who is it? Gunan Padang. I mean, that's sort of got some crazy carbon dating dates, at least crazy to the orthodox. I, I, I think it's completely plausible, but you have stuff when they did the Danny Natawajaja, the He's a geologist, I believe, uh, not an archaeologist, which is why they shut him down at Gunan Padang in Indonesia. But they drilled down into that structure and they found carbon dates that go back 25,000 years, it's, which is just nuts. That's well and truly back into the last ice age. And again, that's an area of the, of the world that would have been entirely livable. That's, um, he was a good guide. He was a little stressed out from us. Um, <laughs> a little stressed out about our reaction to these archaeologists and the people trying to push us off the site but yeah we, we just at that point had gotten pretty used to um to trying to be pushed around the first few times you do it oh, okay we'll do it and then after that it's okay you start ignoring people and every other site now any chance you get to step over the boundary and go in there and take pictures it's always always better to ask for forgiveness uh and not permission because you'll never get permission and the person who taught me this, Santa Hancock, Graham's wife, um, who does all his phot photographic work. And, and that little lady's incredible. Like, I mean, they've been doing this for this sort of stuff for years and years and years. And she just, off she goes. Like, it doesn't matter where. She just, just blithely, just over the barrier, walks right in, gets her pictures and everything. There'd be people yelling at her. No, no matter. We were there with a big group. And it was pretty funny. She stepped over the bears at Temple of the Moon, uh, which is one of the amazing sites around Cusco. See, this is one of these arenas. It's not a pyramid, but they had these like circular arenas. Some of these were the things they said they found a child in and they moved up. But so Santa would, but back to this other side, she would she would step over the barrier and go in and then there'd be like 15 other people from this group. Every, and then everyone is in there. And all of a sudden you've got the one guy in the brown shirt with the little, you know, vest and the hat, like when the whistle, boop, boop, boop. And what do you do? You know, call in all your friends and just ignore them. And they just eventually go, oh, well, too hard. They won't ever get on the radio and do stuff. Like typically they don't kick up a fuss. So you can get away with it. If you're an individual it's a little harder. Um, we have played the um, the distraction game a few times where you distract a guy and then someone else goes in to get stuff, we get into an area and try and take pictures. I don't see any issue with trying to do that. It's all a bit of a game, but I feel like we are we should be able to see some of these places and not, uh, not be kept out of everything. I got, once we got, once got told that we were taking too many photographs. That was Tiwanaku, but yeah. There you got little settlements. Same thing, now again, just more pictures of pyramids. 
Uh, I got a question. Do you think the cataclysm talked about within the Electric Universe community is the same cataclysm being proposed by the Comet Research Group? Do you have the beauty filter on my face? Lol. I don't have any filters on my face. I have lights in my face is what I have. And I have a green screen. Um, I don't have anything on my face. <laughs> I have not got a beauty filter on my face. Yes, photography does hurt that rock. The Electric Universe community... So I, I've looked a little bit into this and I suspect it's similar to Robert Schock's work, right? Where we're talking about... Um, just massive solar flares and electrical storms and you know either or I think there's also like a like a close proximity to other celestial bodies so, types of electrical discharges and whatnot I um look I, I actually think so and Vitri he's Robert Schock has a few good points in what he's proposing as evidence for his theories and I think he, the last I heard from him was the Rogan podcast that he did which was excellent I like his work it's, there's something going on between him and Graham. Like Graham is like, because apparently Robert Shock's been attacking the Comet group, which is like nobody. We don't need that in that alternative community, right? Everyone should be doing. I, my personal opinion is he's got some good evidence for vitrification. To me, it seems like the weight of the evidence is firmly on the on the Comet group side. And he did that Rogan podcast before they found the Hiawatha crater in Greenland, and they've just found a second crater, although that may be a bit older. Uh, I think it's entirely possible that you have both. Um, of these things happening inside of that that cataclysmic age because it's not just the younger dries is something I'm looking at and in, in a video I'm making now it's not just the younger dries you also before the younger dries you had the bowling alarod um, the younger dries is what punctuated the end of the ice age there was these two events separated by about 1300 years that you had this massive deep freeze and these two massive spikes and then also these massive uh, sea level rises that sort of correspond with it but before that, we had the bowling alarod, which is a similar sort of just crazy um, climatic turbulence, really, up massive, massive temperature swings, all data that we've got from the uh, ice core samples, both the Greenland and the Antarctic ice core samples. But I think it's possible you're dealing with both. I mean, vitrification is a good example of something that uh, is possibly a result of solar flares. We certainly know those happen. I think uh, the sun is a huge, huge part of the whole climate discussion certainly it had a larger part it played much larger part during that period of time but yeah i mean I, I think it is a similar cataclysmic time not to say that i mean i think there's other cataclysms in the past i think the the big one that everyone's looking at now is this one that happened at the end of the last ice age um hard to say exactly what happened where but you know vitrification is a really interesting piece of evidence for it because i've actually seen you you had bits of vitrified rock that are underneath cover as well like so if the flare was in the sky and that radiation was coming down the sky it's 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 puzzling to me how that how something that's in a cave then gets vitrified as well i admit i'm not an expert in that stuff so here's another like way off in the distance across the river up the hillside clearly another pyramid um that's all been tarped up and doing something there's a paid version of, Zah of Zahi Hawass <laughs> in every country. I agree. There's always seems to be someone like him running around. He's he's like he's the worst example. I've I've, I've got a little dossier I'm building on a video. I don't want to attack the guy directly, but man, he's just he's just been a force against humanity. Is the way I think of him. Like he just oppressive force. Like he's the one guy that has the ability to shed some light on this stuff, and he just does everything he can to do the opposite. Um, it's really sad and part of that story that i want to tell about him is also wrapped up in the tour company because he's still doing the same thing that he was doing on that so-called debate trip with graham right it was um a, a company called time of new era and they're now called archaeological Pass because they figured out where the where their bread is buttered right it's in zahi because sticking with him you know they've, they've just abandoned the alternative community altogether um it just because zahi gets permissions right so and, and their price is hu hugely huge compared to if you go with say yusuf or Kemet school or muhammad with his you know guide of egypt company and chris dunn is doing tours with muhammad ibrahim um you know they this other company it's just straight up and down profiteering and you you just can tell they got a staff of a million and they it's all about zahi and this and that it's uh and they and I've got some stories to tell about that that 
that uh, that trip we did with Graham and Zahi. And then they marketed it to the alternative community. In fact, they had the whole company name and they changed it later on. It, it was time of a new era or time for a new era or something. They changed it to this archaeological pass. We nicknamed them time for a new lunchbox because they nickeled and dimed us for everything. They, they had the, the one big problem they, they put onto us was this internal flight that we had to take and they hit everyone up for like six or seven hundred dollars to fly from Cairo to Luxor and you know I jumped online at the time and was like well I can book directly with Egypt Air for about 80 bucks and it's not a flight that's at five in the morning which you're going to get us up at the hotel at two in the morning to go catch I'll just meet you up there and they just flipped out and wouldn't let us do it and I'm just like what where does this price why is this all of a sudden six hundred dollars on this early flight that nobody's going to be on it's just profiteering it's a horrible company to, to grow. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think uh, that that debate really did shine a light on Zay. And I actually have, um, it's a really crap recording because of course, this company that he that was arranged, they filmed stuff, they filmed everything and they recorded stuff with professional gear. And they, they were discouraging us from making our own recordings, promising us, blue in the face promising us that we would all get footage we would all get the recordings of course nobody got any footage nobody got any recordings i do have dahi's whole presentation uh just recorded on my phone where including the q a session where he just was like what what is this gobleki tepe you speak of we don't know anything about this it's got nothing to do with egypt never no just over there and it, it actually directly refutes what you said was your it refutes what you said about the sphinx like it's the direct rebuttal to his argument against the Sphinx being that old as in, well, here's your megalithic site that dates exactly to that period that Shock is talking about, even though it's probably older than that. Um, and he, uh, yeah, it's his entire presentation, I've got to tell you, it's 45 or minutes, whatever it was, it was an absolutely 100% appeal to authority. It was this, I took Will Smith here, I took Princess Diana here, I took I remember when I caught the robbers that that uh, I caught the robbers that that ripped off the museum during the Arab Spring. Like personally, like D Indiana Jones here, D Detective Clouseau. It was he personally tracked down and caught these. I mean, just literally, it was this tale after tale of how he took people, how he was an important figure, the important things that he's done. When I discovered this, when I discovered that, it's absolute nonsense. I mean, then you get into the whole side of speculation around Zahi, where it's like. And this is, comes from locals that live there. I mean, it's you know he's the first one into those sites, man. When they find something new, brings his briefcase, he's the first one in. And that guy, remember that guy has he's a politician. He has access to the uh, diplomatic bags. And this is a this is some pretty heavy speculation about how he made his money. You know, like shipping stuff around on the uh, customs free diplomatic bags. And it wasn't all like he he said, oh, "I was my clothing line. I sold my it's all from my clothing line," which he. You know, there's a whole controversy around that too. He 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 used he had a whole photo shoot organised for his clothing line using an Egyptian antiquities to stage it all. I mean, there's a whole story around that if you go digging for it. Um, gave Susan Mubarak a million dollars. Yeah, whatever. It, it's I'll talk about it in another video, but there's a lot there. Um, solar flare that Brian speaks of. Yeah, I think he's talking about the Robert Shock solar flare. I mean, there's just good evidence for, for a giant solar flare at some point in that past. I'm not sure exactly how you date it. It's that it's that radioluminescence um, technique, I think. But I believe it's that's most likely the thing that we're... I think it happened inside that period of cataclysm. I think you had, if not just the comet, then certainly comet or, or cosmic impact along with, I think, solar flare activity. There's good evidence for both. There's a lot of evidence now for the comet. Like, just... Solar flare doesn't explain the black matte layer. It doesn't explain the nano diamonds. It doesn't explain a lot of it. Well, a lot of those do actually correspond between the two, but there are some specific common indicators, and now they've got a crater. And not just a crater, but to me, one of the... I think you had impacts on the ice, and you had some impacts that made it to the bedrock, but like, say, the Laurentide Ice Sheet and the Great Lakes region, I think that's a big impact site because you have the Carolina Bays, and the Carolina Bays, to me, is just a fascinating subject. Antonio Zamora, who I've been back and forth with for a couple of years now I need to I do need to sit down and interview him he's one been one of the primary signs I'm sure he's going to be a big part of Graham Hancock's new book The Time of New America I know he was talking to Graham um, and I've been corresponding with Graham a little bit about it too but he he was um, yeah he, he's just shined he's really done a lot of that primary work to show that the Carolina Bays are effectively fallout from 
the comet impact into the ice on the Laurentide ice sheet, which is super, super interesting. Um, like this splash damage, and they, they're like all these huge depressions, they all line up directly and they point to this one impact site. So you don't necessarily need a crater, but there's an awful lot of evidence supporting this comet impact. Um, but there's also evidence for solar flares. Uh, box on the Serapium. Do you think it could be boxes to preserve food grain during the cataclysm? I don't think so. I, I really I really don't think that those are boxes for grain or for food. There's other ways to preserve stuff. You can just preserve stuff underground. You don't need to box it up. Uh, it seems like a tremendous... To me, that the, the the cost reward doesn't 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 balance out there. The, the actual cost of trying to build one of those boxes is astronomical if all you're going to put inside it is some grain. And it's not even that much grain or seeds. And it's comparative to what you'd need to kickstart a whole civilization. You could. I mean, I'm sure they'd work very well for that purpose, but uh, I don't... I don't know. Actually, someone posted a comment, too, about that even if you put bull sarcophagi or any organic material in general inside a box like that and it was sealed you gotta remember like because they're perfectly flat like then perf hermetically sealed like there's nothing getting in and out just the any off gassing or anything that comes off an organic material i mean as they slowly decay any gas it's going to build up pressure and then eventually just it turns into muck and goo that was a comment that somebody made about the bull sarcophagus which saying that oh, if they're in there they would have just turned to black muck and goo which they didn't they didn't find um, although funnily enough that's that's the type of thing when they in a few boxes they found that type of thing right there was i know uh zayrat el aran when they when they opened up the coffer that was at the bottom of that pit they found like a three inch black layer around it and it's also something that they found inside the boxes that are at the bottom of the osiris shaft uh brian forrester talks about it in one of his videos which was my first look into the Osiris shaft. I know Luke actually went down there pretty recently. But uh, his... Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what that stuff is. Okay. Back to this. There's... I don't know what these are. These are like... Well, this is houses or steps. It's just a lot of architecture to me. It's just a... It's a real mystery, this site. There's a lot going on here. There certainly was a lot going on here. It was just... This was all intended just to be a review of... Kind of my raw footage. If you think it's interesting to do a video on this side, I'll, I'll do a more research and, you know, do like a 10 minute overview on it. I'm pretty sure Chuck's gonna do one and his audience is massive, so. But yeah, if you watch this Chuck, you want any of this stuff, let me know. <laughs> yeah, it's possible that some of this goes down deeper too, I, I would imagine. Again, more just roughly shaped andesite granite thanks thanks on the serapium yeah I'm, I'm going to continue working on that serapium series I've got a lot more plan I've been doing a lot of work on it I, I do actually I did record most of it but it just was so long uh, just the boxes I and I want to do it justice like I I don't I don't seem to have the ability to say anything briefly I've always got a billion things to say about stuff so I've got to try and carve it down but I'm just trying to make that a a nice series of um, concise videos that I, I want it to be like a, a nice definitive series on the Serapium because I, I don't think there's lots of good views of it inside and sort of use of talking about things but I think we can tackle individual areas look at a bit do a bit of research on each of them and then back that up with the things that he's saying uh, that's pretty much my intent for that whole series and I've got a yeah like I said there's a, all these different aspects particularly on the boxes that you can just you, you can't I, it's hard to dodge any of them and I haven't even got to the precision yet. That's that's going to be coming up next. Um, well, quarrying, construction, and the and the uh, the precision is going to come on its own, has its own thing after that. It's interesting on the construction of those boxes. Uh, Chris Dunn tried to get, and this is a story I'll tell in one of them. But he tried to have them made. I mean, it's in his book, which I have over here. But you know, he actually contacted granite manufacturing companies. So, so here we go. This is. See, and this is the site, as you see, we actually saw this was the one that was on the Google Earth at the front of this. But across this river at the back here, there are more pyramids. Like, that's, we took pictures of this across this tree line and this river. There are pyramids dotting all around the site over here. I would have loved to have got my drone down and, and taken some overhead footage, but I'm pretty sure they would have tried to kill me. Um, but maybe it's worth trying to hike in from over there and launch it from a mile away or something. 
Yeah, I get a little more braver with that as I get, as I get older too. Okay. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I hope that work on the Serapium will, will get somewhere. I mean, it has tiny views com comparative to everything else, but these things take time. I'm just at the phase trying to build this channel up. I mean, we did the other video on the Puka J channel, and I mean, that's got 45,000 views now, which is nice. I think my Serapium stuff's not even at 1,000. Um, and I'd like to, you know, I mean, my, my numbers aren't quite at 1,000 subs yet either, like just over three on, on the Puka J channel, but we haven't done anything on that in a year. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a slow burn. I'm trying to get there, but that's the intent. I'm just trying to build an audience and make some stuff. Yeah, yeah, the underground nature of it's crazy to me. That, and I'm going to talk about that in particular too. The 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 fact that there's less than a foot of clearance. I mean, some of those boxes, like both sides included, you you have this much space between the walls and that box. I don't know how they got them in there. I mean, there's a box in the hallway. I mean, again, it's one of those examples of it looks like it was interrupted at some point. Like the, the construction, that's like something happened and work stopped. They left that box where it was. And that box in the hallway in the Serapium is like completely shatters the stupid idea of sleds and things because there's nothing under that box. If there was a sled or there was something under that box, they would have found it. They, you guaranteed they would have, that would have been like, hey, we found the sled, we found the, the stuff. Uh, I, uh, that you know if they if that had matched if they'd found anything remotely like what their theories are for how they move those stones around and and if there was any evidence of it there they would be talking about it and you can go and look at it there's nothing there I, don't, I mean I don't know how they move those boxes in those areas there's just there's zero chance it was people put it that way it, hauling it one way I, I mean put it this way I don't think the ancient Egyptians moved them I don't think that I don't think the ancient Egyptians did they built the floor around them that's one of the points I'm going to make we're not moving them. I bet if they could, they would have taken them out and put them somewhere else, put them in a museum, but we ain't moving them. I mean, the only way, so something Yusuf says, the best way to make that place would have been to open the entire roof up. Like, take the... It would be less effort to literally take all the bedrock off the top of it, put the boxes in, then build the, build the bedrock back on top of it. Presumably how they did some of the pyramid boxes, because some of those boxes are just far too big for the tunnels to get in and out. But that's not what happened in the Serapium. Like, they... They move them down there and finish them down there somehow. And I do not know how. Anyway, they put the limestone ceiling on the box chambers. No, it's just bedrock. It's There's not any blocks, it's just bedrock. They tunneled out. They tunneled that place out. The melting of the boxes themselves, of course, don't have a melting aesthetic like that. Yeah, so you're talking about the finishing? Right, there's a whole thing on the finishing. It's, there's, there's actually, this is where it gets into when I said there's evidence of technology that we definitely do not have. That's one of them, is the finishing on the box. There's, if you look closely, and it's not just in the Serapium, once you see it, you can see it in a lot of other places after that. And I'll make that point, but there is evidence of some kind of liquid. It's a, some kind of, I mean, you could call it alchemy. It's the same thing saying chemistry all comes from Kemet, right? It's all, it all means Egypt eventually. Um, entomology speaking entomologically but uh, yeah that's like it looks like that was a liquid polish that was somehow made that finish did was that final step on once you made it flat then there was some liquid that was applied to that surface that gave it the polish that finished it and there's evidence you can see where that liquid has gone to the underside of lids and formed droplets and come off it it's absolutely insane not only that but it is almost like it's penetrated into the granite and that's what's given it this this surface uh it's like the surface layer that's harder and if and you can see that where the where the boxes have been chipped away because obviously people have tried over the years to get into them or you can see the lips of the edges have been smashed off and you can actually see a very thin layer it's almost it's not just a so it's not just a polishing it's somehow changed the structure of the granite and again i don't know if anyone's taken a little chip of this and put on a microscope or tried to figure out what's been the actual chemical effect of this polish because that and that's I've had people talk to oh it's acid and this and that we don't do that today you, you can't that nothing we know of does has this particular effect on granite we polish granite with polishing pads and slurries and hydraulic pressure I mean <laughs> what are you it's 
it, yeah, it's a, it's it's astonishing. And then the proof for that is also in the divots and the uneven surfaces. Like how you polish that with sand and stone is it's ridiculous. It, it's a liquid polish. And I, I just think if 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 people would open up their mind and go and look at it in that respect, then we might learn something. But no, no, that that's outside of the bounds of our orthodox story, right? So reading comments. Serapium always disrupts the explanation of huge numbers. It does. The Serapium is, to me, is the, is the, it's just the, it's the clincher. It's like, to me, it's, that's why I really want to focus on Serapium, because it, to me, it stands alone as a side. Like, there's lots of proof of all sorts of stuff. What the hell is playing in that music? Um, the, there's proof of lots of different sites have lots of different indicators of high technology, but the Serapium on its own is just, to me, is, is just a, is just a, uh, yeah, it's it stands to me. It's the most proof. It's in one place. It's just the most mind-bending site, and there are boxes in other places that have all the same attributes, but not like the collection of them that you get in that one place. And they're the biggest too. Like it's just, uh, I love that place. It's my favorite place in Egypt. I go there every time, and there's no one ever there. Like we, I, it's just Egypt's like that at the moment. I I love going there. It's just there's no one there, and you can. You can spend if you take get use of him for a day, take you everywhere and spend as long as you want down there. He knows all the guys and they'll open up all the doors and I mean there's tunnels that go off in different directions and Alright. Have I seen the video from Matt that talks about the melting through alchemy? It's a great video that makes sense. I have I jeez, he does yeah, you're talking about the his theory on the um, uh, South American walls. I think, and the and the melting of the or the hardening, I guess, of the melted stone. There's he's got some. He does have some interesting content. I uh, I think I've seen the one you're talking about, and I have the similar opinion on a lot of those walls. Where it, I mean, to me, that somehow that you change the consistency of those walls in Cusco and things to um, toffee or something like that, and they were pushed in and they molded to each other. It sort of does explain the precision that you see because. I mean, it's a mind-bendingly complex three-dimensional shape to then have done so precise that they just are, are completely matching each other in every dimension on the inside surface is nuts. And there's some very good examples in my, I think I showed them in my ink and stonework video, of those inside surfaces and lips and it's just, uh, yeah, it's hard to imagine how that was done by hand. By any real um, mechanical mechanism even. Ah, good question. Um, do you think there's a similarity with the liquid on the box in the Serapium and what you see in the joints of the polygonal stones in Peru? It's possible. I have not seen the exact. I haven't seen the same droplets and the actual evidence of polishing to the same degree. Although, what you do see, it, the vitrification looks like the same thing. Like the result. It, it, I don't see the droplets and the like because you just have polished stone right and then the, the evidence for the liquid is on like on the underside surfaces that aren't polished so for example the lids the outside of the lids the vertical surfaces are polished but the inside the sort of the bottom surface of the lid that sits on top of the box wasn't polished but because those lids have been canted and they're skewed off the box you can actually, you can see some of these areas and what you see is this whatever was polishing the top surface came down and there's little eddies and liquids and drops that where those drops were and where that liquid flowed on, under, it turned the corner and sort of, imagine water, you now it drips off something, it's the same thing happened here. And where it was is, is perfectly polished and smooth, just like the other parts of the box. I haven't seen examples of that type of dripping and example of a liquid, but the vitrification, that polished smooth surface is the same. It seems the same to me as the polished smooth surface that you get on the granite. To me, it's an indicator of, yeah, I mean, whatever, maybe it was the same thing. Because uh, I think you're, you're talking the same global culture is probably responsible for a lot of this stuff. So, yeah, it, I'd ha I, it's in the same ballpark. I just hadn't seen the same exact evidence of, like, liquid. Not to say it's not there, I just haven't seen it. All right. Well, this is an interesting test. Um, if you guys have anything in particular I mean I'm sort of wandered all over heats possible too yeah I mean there's lots of different methods possible for uh, for how that vitrification I mean that's the theory with um, the solar flare right heat heat and um, 
radiation of some form creating that vitrified surface it's, it's interesting actually you, where I live in Northern California there's certain I mean California's been farmed to death and it's also it's also an area that they know the mo it's probably the area that, where they know the most of about the, the geological nature of it like it's been had the most study done to it pretty much of anywhere in the world and everything on the flatlands has been farmed over and over and over, and over. but there's some mountain ranges and little mountain like the, the Sutter Buttes here and you have rocks and stuff that do have like a black almost carbon layer on top of them and I think what what this is there's a good geologic I can't recall it right now but there's a, a, a geologist that runs a site that's gone and looked at a lot of this stuff you have to go up into the hills that's the areas that haven't been farmed to find some of these rocks and he's chipped them off and you have a millimeter or two of these like charred black carbon layers and I think what he's saying they're the, probably the result of is air bursts so when I think of the Younger Dryas and these cataclysms I don't think of just one big impact I think there was a, a several of them um, and not just impacts, but also air bursts of smaller parts. So it's like a nuclear bomb going off in the sky, basically. Uh, kaboom, like a Tunguska, but times a thousand. And he's suggesting that this 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 patina, this uh, black carbon layer that's on a lot of these rocks, is evidence for that. Um, hard to date it, but but he said it's basically you've got evidence on 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 all these sites of uh, of air burst impacts. Not only that, but you can actually see where the the large boulders and, and 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 this is again not just on it's not on the flatlands it's on the mountains but where all these large boulders have been pushed and moved like they've actually been as if this blast wave came from the sky and moved all of these things there's actually even some paths you can still see where these giant rocks were were tumbled around it's kind of interesting um it's it's this weird war that's going on in geology it's again i'm making this point in this new video i'm, I'm looking at but it's this quiet war that's been going on for a couple of hundred years in geology now, and it has its it has its origins in the fact that for the first 50 or 60 years of the 19th century, so the 1800s, because you're in the age age of an age of enlightenment, right? Where, where geology and the sciences are beginning to emerge, scientific method, and they're trying to separate themselves from religion. So when you come to particularly the Western religions, well, every religion really is has this catastrophism as a, at its core. In our case, these giant floods and world-ending events, and the geologists were doing everything they could. There was a stated effort. It was a it was a definitely documented goal that they had for that 50 to 60 years to get away from um, catastrophism and use uniformitarianism and gradualism to explain everything. So none of this, none of the features we see are possible. They just would like this is not. Don't ever use catastrophes or cataclysms to explain it just use these men gentle and mild processes we see in place today uh, erosion and whatnot that happen over thousands of years to explain everything and that's literally what's still in the geological textbooks and you've got guys like Randall Carlson that are out there trying to fight this fight and J. Harlan Bretz who was the guy who figured out the scab lands up in Washington state were all created from one giant flood and rather than you know hundreds of little floods and it's or thousands of years and it's pretty obvious when you go up there and this is going to be part of this video but that's the type of th like that's why it's not really acknowledged that that all of this evidence points towards these catastrophes it does point towards it it's just not the accepted excuse for it if you like it's uh it's it actually makes a lot more sense it's a much more elegant solution for the evidence that we see and this evidence in particularly in the americas is everywhere like it's it's in the the evidence on these rocks for airburst it's in places like the channeled scablands it's in the arroyos and the channel like the creeks and the creek beds in the southwestern united states um arizona places like that where you have eight to ten feet of a single strata of of material which is indi indicative of like an eight to ten foot mudslide that basically went across half of the continent and and that's still in place that everything now is built on top of. Uh, but slowly, 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 these processes, I think, and these uh, methods, are, there's some acknowledgement happening that, okay, like we're almost there with the Channel Scablands now. Like, okay, it was one flood or maybe it was a few different floods. I think still think it was one flood. Um, and Randall Carlson has an excellent sort of one of his videos talking about the viability of ice dams and stuff that gets into the details about why that's one flood. But... Uh, yeah, slowly, slowly, that I think the, the those textbooks will change. I mean, some of the, and actually, the closer you look at the geological excuses for some of the landmarks and the landscapes we see, it, the more ridiculous they become. Like, 
one of the examples again Randall uses is water gaps there's a this water gap often roads go through them but it's like a gap between two hillsides and two hills and it's as if the geo the little the, the actual explanation for this in the textbooks is that a river has caused this but over a long period right so the river has eroded the land down but at the same rate that the river has eroded that land down at exactly the same rate these hills have risen up so it's like this you've got to have two equal forces going at exactly the same rate over thousands of years and that's the only explanation for how this happened or you can assume that it happened as part of one giant cataclysmic event and that was just the weakness in that whole strata and that's where it got carved out which is a much more elegant solution and turns out has a lot of evidence behind it given that we have more information now about the true sort of climate history of the planet but in the textbooks water gaps that happened because of these two equal forces happening at the same time over a long period which is really unlikely um but that, those are the sort of nuances and detail that that this this little war is being fought on um tim francis can we rule out that the boxes were poured set like concrete i think so uh i don't believe that's the case i i can't rule it out though i i don't know but granite I think you have a few examples, and I don't think this is necessarily the case for these boxes, but you do have some examples of places like that that, that have megalithic work that have still had fossils and um, things like that inside them, that uh, fossilized material that wouldn't be there if it was poured as a slurry. And I've never ever heard of something be able to do it and work with granite like that, but hey, it's you know, it doesn't seem like it, because again, if I were to do it anything with the whole the whole concrete argument to me uh it comes down to effort and the molds right i mean anything that you're pouring into a mold is you would you would use that mold more than once right you would you wouldn't just create because anything you all those boxes are slightly different so you would build a box for every you build a mold for every box same thing with the pyramids right people say that oh they cast these stones it's well Every, every box would re require a mold and now your, your effort has just doubled. Like it, that's the only issue I have with the concrete theory. And I'm not, I'm not ruling it out, but to me it's like, if you were to cast the blocks and you were to make a mold and then somehow you had the ability to cast them like a concrete, you would reuse the same molds and casings. But all the stones are different, all the boxes are different. So therefore you would have needed a different mold. Same with the H blocks, exactly. Just want to say that I enjoy watching with you with Yusuf Awan. His knowledge is ancient. Yeah, it is. Thank you. Oh, cheers. How is how is Ken? I, I'm complaining about the cold here. I'm not going to do that. I'm talking to you. <laughs> Quebec's probably a lot colder than it is right here. Um, I'm sure it is. Yeah, Yusuf's great. Yusuf's uh, one of my favorite people. He's awesome. Um, and I've been lucky to hang out with him quite a bit, like in his house. We and interviewed him a few times his place is amazing above his store that literally at his top of his the buildings like five stories the whole family was there and at the top it's just this you know incredible little little just a little like open area thing on top of the building some couches he's got a lot of stones and little bits and pieces that he's collected over the years and it's just literally right in front of the sphinx and the pyramid you can sit there and watch the the, the light show that they run on the pyramid every night he's very good on a few instruments he has his he has his brothers and who Sadat and these other guys that are also exceptionally good at, at a bunch of stuff. And I sat down there one night and they all just jammed. It was like a one of the, the guitars, a drum, a flute, and they played some amazing music. It's we I, we use some of it in the Pugajay stuff, and I will use it on this channel as well. Um, but we sat there. I, I recorded a whole bunch of his music, and yeah, I've been it's been fun to be able to hang out with him and all his boys a couple times. All right, so pyramids. There were pyramids on this place. I think uh, I'm gonna ramble on forever. I am probably gonna bring this to a close. If you thought this was fun, thanks for tuning in, you guys. It's the first time I'm just testing it. But if this is something you'd like to see, then let me know. Uh, and let me know if you have any suggestions because I've got a lot of sites like this and a lot of, uh, lot of material, you know. I've got tons and tons and tons of material. And it's not all ever gonna see the light of day, but we could pick some topics or pick some things and pieces and i'd actually like to if you're interested maybe get some other people in on a skype call uh i've talked with chuck over at the cf apps channel maybe we can do that but um yeah if you've got if you like it let me know any suggestions i can do it but i will probably do this from time to time yeah but right now i'm probably going to go back to uh editing this video up and as ian said probably just prepping up for the <laughs> the uh 
the UFC, which I will be watching later tonight. I'm a bit of a savage in that regard, so that's the way it goes. All right, guys, cheers. Thanks for watching. Appreciate it. Thanks for the comments. Take it easy. I guess I have to stop streaming over in this window. I'm still learning. Anyway, catch you guys next time. Cheers.